So I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. So today, um, thank you very much, uh, Yvonne, for the introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about breast cancer basics and what you need to know about screening. Here are my disclosures. I'm here on a volunteer basis. I have no relevant financial conflicts, including the fact that I have no financial interest in any of the technologies I will discuss. I'm going to cover all these topics in the next 40 minutes or so. I'll explain what cancer is, what the risk factors are, and what signs of cancer you can look for. I'll just stress the benefits of early detection and why you should be screened and how to increase the likelihood of finding breast cancer earlier if you're unlucky enough to get it. I'll cover what's wrong with the guidelines in Canada. I'll explain what dense breasts are and why it's critical for you to know if your breasts are dense and what you can do if you have dense breasts. I'll also point out some of the common myths about breast cancer. Starting with the basics, breast cancer is a disease where a group of cells loses normal control. These abnormal cells grow, usually into a lump, and they invade and damage the surrounding normal tissue. They can spread to other parts of the body, like lymph nodes and other organs. It's important for you to know that breast cancer is not life-threatening when it's just in the breast. It's when it spreads to other body parts that it can kill. Now, many cancers can be found before that spread happens and when they can be more easily treated with less aggressive therapy. So who gets breast cancer? Well, anyone and almost any age. Breast cancer is very uncommon, but still occurs in the 20s and 30s. And even men can get breast cancer, although it's uncommon. About 1% of all breast cancers occur in men. So myth number one, I sadly sometimes hear from young women that they didn't see their doctor when they found a lump in their breast because they assumed that they were too young to get breast cancer. And even women who do go to see their doctor are sometimes dismissed because the doctor thinks they're too young. And that's not true. One in eight women get breast cancer overall, but that's not uniform across all ages. The breast cancer risk increases as women age. So the risk for a 20 year old is about one in 1700. That's in the next 10 years. Risk that dramatically, uh, sorry, dramatically increases in the forties. For a 40 year old, it's one in 69. That's why we should all have screening mammograms starting at age 40, especially black, Asian and Hispanic women who tend to get breast cancer younger than white women. Their peak incidence is in the mid forties. For white women, it's in the late 50s and early 60s. And black women are more likely to be diagnosed with aggressive cancers. They're 40% more likely to die from breast cancer than white women. There are many other factors besides age that can increase a woman's risk of getting breast cancer above average. Now, some are beyond our control, listed here on the left such as having one of the breast cancer genes, the BRCA genes, having had chest wall radiation for lymphoma before age 30, having dense breast tissue, having Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, a family history of breast cancer, especially in a first degree relative like a mother, sister, or daughter. If you've had a biopsy that showed atypical cells, that increases your risk of getting breast cancer. Women who start having periods younger than average or who go into menopause later than average are at higher risk, and women who've had no children. Now, the list on the right is a list of factors you can control to reduce your risk. Minimizing the use of combined hormone therapy after menopause can reduce risk. The decision to use hormones after menopause depends on many things, including your age, how far away you are from entering menopause, and what symptoms you expect to control. That's a discussion you should have with your doctor and decide whether the benefits will outweigh any risks. Other factors that can lower breast cancer risk include a low-fat diet, minimal or no alcohol, moderate exercise, not smoking, and maintaining a healthy body weight. Now, no one likes to hear about the role of alcohol in breast cancer, but we've known for some time that even small amounts of alcohol are linked to several types of cancer. In Canada, new recommendations came out a couple of months ago that more than two drinks a week is risky. And some people think that's too conservative, but we do know that three to six drinks a week increases the risk of developing cancers, including colorectal and breast cancer. And more than seven drinks a week also increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. I often hear women say, oh, I don't drink that much, just a glass of wine every night with dinner. Well, that's not harmless. Myth number three, 
Some women tell me that they don't need to worry about breast cancer because no one in their family has had it. Although the risk of breast cancer is higher in women with a history of breast cancer, especially, as I said, in a mother, sister, or daughter, women and even sometimes physicians are surprised to learn that 80 to 85% of all women who get breast cancer have no family history. That's why all women need to be screened, not just those at increased risk. The most significant risk factors for getting breast cancer are being a woman and growing older. And among women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, dense breasts are more frequent than a family history. I'll talk about dense breasts later. This is a free online risk calculator for women who've not had breast cancer. It estimates a woman's risk in the next 10 years and over a lifetime. It's easy to use with just a few questions. Women with a higher lifetime risk, greater than 25%, are regarded as very high risk. You can Google IBIS risk calculator to see your risk. And you So we do want to find breast cancer as early as possible, but it would be even better if we could prevent it altogether. If girls followed a healthy lifestyle starting in childhood, it's thought that most breast cancers could be prevented. Even if women wait until middle age to make changes, it's thought that as many as half of all breast cancers could be prevented. Walking 30 minutes a day can lower breast cancer risk by 20%. Breastfeeding for a year, and that includes all children, not each one, lowers risk by 20%. An overweight woman who loses 10 pounds decreases her risk by 10%. And if she loses 20 pounds, she lowers her risk by 50%. But even if a woman does everything right, she can still get breast cancer. At the end of the day, it's just bad luck. And no woman should feel guilty or responsible if she does develop breast cancer. Myth number four is that breast cancer always shows up as a lump. Well, it can, but not always. And remember, most lumps are not cancer. Cancer can show up in many other ways. It can show up as an area that just feels firmer than the tissue around it, or dimpling on the skin, or crust on the nipple, or sores on the skin. Discharge from the nipple isn't always cancer. In fact, if it's white, yellow, or green, it's not suspicious. But if discharge comes out all by itself without squeezing, and it's clear like water or bloody, it should be checked. A nipple that's retracted or pulled in can be normal, especially if it's been like that for a long time. But if it's new and just happened recently, it should be checked. And if the skin gets thick on anywhere on the breast and dimpled like the skin of an orange, that should be promptly checked. This photo is from a website called Know Your Lemons. It shows some of the ways breast cancer can manifest. They also have an app you can check out, knowyourlemons.org. So I've covered the risk factors, the suggestions that might reduce the risk to get cancer, and how to recognize possible breast cancer when it's visible or feelable. But now I'm going to discuss early detection of breast cancer. Screening detects cancer sometimes years before it can be felt as a lump or seen as dimpling. When cancer is found and treated earlier, many more lives are saved. But another reason to find cancer earlier, aside from saving lives, is so that it can be successfully treated with less aggressive therapy. And that means better quality of life for women with breast cancer. When breast cancer is detected later, mastectomy is usually required. But when we find it earlier, a woman can have a lumpectomy instead. Lymphedema, you guys probably know this, is swelling in the arm and hand from blockage of the lymphatic vessels in the armpit. It's a common side effect of traditional armpit surgery done for lymph node staging called axillary dissection. It's usually permanent and it can be the worst part about breast cancer for many women. When cancer is detected earlier, women can have a less invasive procedure called a sentinel node biopsy, which has a much lower risk of lymphedema. Women deserve the opportunity to avoid this complication. Chemotherapy, of course, is awful to go through, and some women suffer long-term complications. Now, many women can avoid chemo if their cancer is small, if there are zero to three positive nodes, and if they're determined to be at low risk of recurrence by genetic testing, genomic testing. This is another important reason to find cancers early. Early detection saves lives. The overall five-year survival from breast cancer is 87%. When women are diagnosed at stage zero or one, it's virtually 100%. And fortunately, 65% of women are diagnosed at these stages. But even with new and better treatments, five-year survival is only 23% when it's diagnosed at stage four. And about 6% of women are diagnosed at that stage. 
I can't discuss breast cancer screening in Canada without including comments on the Canadian Task Force on Preventive Health Care. Going forward, I'm just going to call them the Task Force. Their guidelines have led to thousands of avoidable deaths since 2011. They recommend not screening women in the 40s, and they say women over 50 should be screened over every only every two to three years. Well, the reason their guidelines are wrong, especially regarding women in the 40s, is because they base them on research that has now been discredited. And it's unfortunate the same research, believe it or not, is being used in other countries to deny women screening in their 40s. More on that later, but first I want to introduce you to Shira Farber from Toronto, who's an unfortunate example of a woman who has suffered as a direct result of the task force guidelines and because of an education gap among women and physician that needs to be closed. In the interest of time, I've edited out the I've edited out the beginning of her story. And then I turned 40 and I went for my annual checkup with my family doctor, who was a really, really wonderful family doctor. Um, and I asked her about getting a mammogram. Just it was a simple, normal part of my checkup, like asking whether I needed a tetanus shot or a vaccine or a pap. Um, and I was advised at that time that Ontario's screening program had changed to 50 plus and that I wouldn't need a mammogram until I was 50. And I remember feeling relieved at that time because I was actually frightened to have a mammogram. I had heard nightmare stories about it being painful and uncomfortable. And now living what I've lived through, I find it pretty funny to think that this simple test has been made to be so to be so scary to so many women. I wasn't aware at the time that 80 to 85% of women with breast cancer do not have a family history. I was also not aware the Canadian breast screening guidelines stated that the decision to have a mammogram is a woman's choice based on her values and preferences. Now I know that there's a significant education gap because many doctors and women seem to not know this either. And like me, some women are still being denied mammogram requisitions in their 40s. At the age of 48, just as we were beginning to surface from the pandemic, I felt something strange in my chest. It wasn't exactly a lump. It felt more like my breast was full of silicone and that I describe it as it felt like a Nerf ball was stuck inside of it. I let it go for a few days and then my husband noticed it and I realized I couldn't really get let it go much further. So I called my family doctor who immediately referred me for a mammogram and ultrasound. But because of the pandemic, I couldn't get an appointment for about six weeks for a mammogram. When I did, it was apparent it was breast cancer. A biopsy was taken. Three large tumors were found, and I was diagnosed with advanced stage breast cancer, and I then began my treatment protocol a few months later. My treatment consisted of aggressive chemotherapy, a mastectomy with no option of immediate reconstruction, a complete sentinel node dissection of almost 40 nodes that resulted in permanent lymphedema of my arm, followed by radiation. Most recently, I underwent a mastectomy on the contralateral side and a complex reconstruction using my abdominal tissue. I suffered serious cardiac related issues from radiation treatment and I required weeks of hospitalization. My joints have been severely impacted by chemotherapy and hormone therapy drugs. Stairs are a challenge for me as are long distances. To prevent the risk of recurrence, recurrence I continue to have treatments that can result in serious side effects including jaw necrosis. I am doing everything I possibly can to avoid a recurrence so that I can be around to enjoy this next phase of my life. I want to see my children flourish as adults. I want to have grandchildren. And I want to grow old with my husband. Sorry. The physical and emotional side effects of treatment have been debilitating. The impact on my family is secondary cancer. I wasn't able to work for over a year. I almost lost my business. I incurred tremendous debt and legal fees to get back on my feet. My husband had to reduce his workload to care for me and our children. Two of my children required therapy to cope with the situational anxiety and stress. And I could no longer be a caregiver to my mother. I have met so many incredible women also blindsided by a similar advanced stage diagnosis. Two of them who I shared a very close relationship with Actually, we all belong to the uh, High Lifeline support group together. And two of them unfortunately died within the past year, and they've left their young families behind. If you had told me a few years ago that I'd be advocating at all levels of government on this issue or speaking to the media, 
and doing educational webinars like this, I would have told you you were crazy. I've always had a big mouth. I've always advocated for friends and family, but I've never really advocated for myself. I was also quite shy about my body and I never really wanted that kind of attention drawn to myself. But I did learn in Hebrew school that saving one life is equivalent to saving the world. And I believe that by sharing my story with other women so that they can become more educated on the issue, I am hopefully making a difference. Canadian breast screening guidelines ignore current evidence and recommend screening at 50. Many provinces ignore the guidelines and begin self-referral at 40. The women of Ontario and all Canadian women deserve the same chance to find cancer early as a woman living elsewhere in Canada. The Canadian Cancer Society recently withdrew their endorsement of the breast screening guidelines. They believe there is an obligation to ensure guidelines are keeping pace with newer research and the needs of our diverse population. This should include screening women at 40 because it saves lives. I strongly believe that if I had been allowed to begin mammograms in my 40s, as permitted in other provinces, I would not have suffered to the degree that I have, nor would I be facing a future of living with a high chance of recurrence and metastases. I encourage you to advocate for your own health and become educated, but also, and maybe more importantly, to speak out for women who can't. So um, I'll just uh, editorialize a little bit about what Shira said. First of all, you need to realize she is in Ontario. And in British Columbia, we're very lucky that our screening program from the get-go has allowed women to self-refer for screening mammography starting at 40. But because women don't know how important it is, only about 25% of eligible women in the province are having those tests. Uh, so I hope you'll all be more interested when we finish this lecture. The other thing to mention is she did mess up a little bit when she said she'd had an extensive sentinel node biopsy and they took out 40 lymph nodes. She had an axillary dissection. Uh, and, and that's important because she did get uh, lymphedema. So now I want to talk about uh, some of the tests that can be used to screen for cancer. And I'm going to discuss them uh, in more detail. But before we do, um, I want to mention breast self-examination. Um, and I'll, I'll explain later why I'm a big proponent of uh, breast self-exam, but I want you to realize thermography has been completely discredited for screening uh, by both FDA and Health Canada. It can find big cancers close to the skin, but we don't have trouble with those. And it misses smaller cancers deeper in the breast with an unacceptably high false alarm rate. So um, thermography is off the table. Now, the term breast self-examination has gone out of fashion, and women are told to be breast aware and are told to see their doctor if they notice any change. But how's a woman supposed to know if there's been a change if she doesn't know what her normal breast texture is? And to complicate matters, there's no one normal for all women. Some, some women's breasts normally feel soft and uniform. Others, even though they're normal, can feel like a bag of marbles. And some women's breasts feel very firm throughout. No two women's breasts are the same. But when a woman does breast self-exam, she quickly becomes familiar with what her normal texture is, more so than a healthcare professional who might examine her only once a year. Now, there are lots of demonstrations on how to do breast self-exam on YouTube, but an excellent one that I recommend is by Dr. Liz O'Reardon. She's a breast cancer surgeon in the UK, and she's had breast cancer. The first link is for uh, regular breast self-exam, and the second one is for women who've had mastectomy and how to examine their chest wall. For those of you who, have, who haven't had one yet, this is how a mammogram is done. Each breast is compressed twice and only for a few seconds, once from top to bottom and the second time at a bit of an angle from side to side. A low dose x-ray is taken in each position. Now the compression is uncomfortable, but it should not be excruciating. And it's necessary for two reasons. Number one, to spread out the tissue so it makes it easier to find cancers. And second, second of all, to reduce the radiation required for adequate penetration of the tissue. Women who are still having menstrual periods should try to schedule their mammogram appointment when they're just finishing or soon after their period. That's when breasts should be the least sensitive. Here's another myth. Women with implants sometimes think that they can't have mammograms. Not true. Mammograms are also safe and recommended for women with implants. 
Now, I know radiation is a concern for some people, but not for experts. The radiation risk from a mammogram is primarily in women younger than age 20, and we virtually never do mammography at that, that age. It's negligible after age 40. We're all exposed to natural source radiation every day from the air, the ground, and the water. And the radiation dose from a mammogram is similar to natural source radiation you'd receive in seven weeks living at sea level. Uh, radiation is higher at higher elevation. So the dose of a mammogram is also similar to what you'd get living in Colorado for three to four weeks, or the same doses you would get taking five transatlantic flights. Flight attendants are in fact exposed to uh, this radiation occupationally and are at a high risk to get breast cancer. This graph shows the amount of radiation from various medical tests. You can see that mammograms are right near the bottom along with chest X-ray and bone densitometry. They're much lower than a coronary calcium score and very much lower than for a virtual colonoscopy, a CT scan, or a PET scan. The mortality rate for breast cancer in Canada was unchanged for decades, but from 1989, when screening mammography was introduced, the death rates have plummeted. There have been 32,000. This is the, the actual number, and that was the expected number if it had kept on the same tra trajectory. Uh, there have been 32,000 fewer breast cancer deaths than expected since 1986, which is convincing confirmation of the safety and success of screening and improved treatment. If radiation was causing breast cancers, uh, we wouldn't see a decrease in deaths. Annual mammograms starting at age 40 save the most lives. And this is recognized even by organizations like the task force that recommend starting later and or screening less often. Now they know that their guidelines will lead to more avoidable deaths. Please share this critical information with fr family, friends, and colleagues in their 40s. Here's why it's important to start at 40. One in six breast cancers or 17% are diagnosed in women in their 40s and cancer grows faster in younger women, which explains why 27% of the years of life lost to breast cancer occur to women who are diagnosed in their 40s. The most years of life are saved when women have mammograms every year starting at 40. This study was done in Canada on almost 2.8 million women attending screening programs. Overall, women who have mammograms are 40% less likely to die of breast cancer than those who don't. And women in their 40s are 44% less likely to die. This shows the importance of having mammograms starting at 40. And yet, because of the task force, there are only four regions in Canada that allow women to self-refer starting at 40. As I mentioned, British Columbia is one of them. But there is a workaround in other provinces for women in their 40s. In Canada, each province makes its own decisions around health. So a woman's access to early detection depends on where she lives. As I said, four start at 40, Alberta starts at 45. In the other provinces that start at 50, the workaround is this. A woman can go to her mammogram, go to her family doctor, and if she can get a requisition from her family doctor or nurse practitioner, they're supposed to provide one. But as you heard, some family doctors and nurse practitioners don't know that. And if they refuse, we see the scenario that, sh that happened to Shira. There is help on how to advocate on a website, mybreastscreening.ca, if you get pushback from your family doctor. And remember, it's a woman's right to have a mammogram. But in British Columbia, women can phone and make their own appointment. They don't need a requisition and they don't need their family doctor's approval. Women in their 40s who can't, whose cancer grow, grow faster than an older women deserve early detection. And it should be available and encouraged everywhere. They're caring for young children and aging parents. They're working and contributing to the economy. Sheer is the poster child for that. Women in their 40s are not expendable. In 2021, this data is from the Canadian Cancer Society, there were 3,400 uh, 3, women aged 40 to 49 in Canada diagnosed with breast cancer. And we know that the incidence of breast cancer is increasing in younger women. Now you see the numbers decline as women get older, but that's not because breast cancer is uh, less of a threat, it's because they start dying of other causes. A woman's risk of breast cancer keeps increasing as she gets older. So if she doesn't die of something else, like a heart attack or a different cancer, her breast cancer risk keeps climbing. My colleagues and I are using all avenues available to work towards getting other jurisdictions to lower the screening age to 40. And we need to get more women in British Columbia to take advantage of this gift. 
So when should women stop having screening mammograms? Well, many women mistakenly think that they don't need to go once they're 74 because that's when many of the screening programs end. But a woman's risk of breast cancer, as I said, keeps rising if she doesn't die of something else. And so many organizations recommend that if a woman's in good health, with a life expectancy of 10 years, then it's worth continuing screening to find those cancers when they're small. An individual woman's decision to continue screening should be based on her health, her life expectancy, and her values. And life expectancy is pretty good. The average life expectancy for a 75-year-old woman in Canada is 13 years. And for an 80-year-old, it's 10 years. So stopping at age 80 would be reasonable, but it depends on your general health and your personal values. I have a friend who's 84 years old. She just bought a bike and she rides three k, th- uh, sorry, 10K three times a week outside. She's still having mammograms. Now in seven provinces, women can continue to self-refer past age 74 and happily BC is one that can, but many cannot. And, and, and in those provinces, just like for the women in the forties, they need a requisition from a doctor. And that adds an unnecessary barrier, especially since we know there's so many women who don't have a family doctor. The biggest obstacle to optimal screening in Canada is the task force. They're a federally funded panel that makes screening guidelines, not just for breast cancer, but for prostate and other cancers and other health concerns like postpartum depression screening, developmental delay in kids, and so on. And they send their guidelines to all the GPs and nurse practitioners in Canada. The panel making the breast cancer screening guidelines has no breast cancer experts on it. Let that sink in. The panel making the breast cancer screening guidelines in Canada has no breast cancer experts. They're mainly GPs, nurses, uh, statisticians. There's even a, um, an occupational therapist and a chiropractor, uh, but no radiologist, no oncologist, no breast surgeon, no pathologist. This panel uh, made a number of errors and they decided that what they call the harms of screening outweighed the benefits. So here are the recommendations. I've already told you a couple. They don't recommend screening in the 40s. They say women aged 50 to 74 should be screened every two to three years. They say women should not do breast self exams. They say doctors and nurse practitioners should not do clinical breast exams as part of a physical. And they say that women with dense breasts don't need any additional screening over and above mammography. Now, um, in British Columbia, we started out with the best program. In 1988, all women over 40 could come every year. And they've they've taken uh, away um, accessibility gradually over the years. Right now, um, the only women who can go every year in BC are women with a first degree family history of breast cancer. But I told you 85% of the women who get breast cancer have no family history, which means that the vast majority of women who will get breast cancer don't have the same opportunity for early detection. Now, given that mammograms save lives and improve the quality of life for women with breast cancer, you might wonder, how could they arrive at these guidelines? Well, in their estimation, they say the harms of screening outweigh the benefits. Well, what do they call harms? They're not really harms, but they're risks. The harm that they're most concerned about is the anxiety women experience if they're called back for more tests and turn out not to have breast cancer. And they make them sound worse than they are by calling them false positives. False alarms happen with all screening tests like pap smears. They certainly cause anxiety, but it's short lived and it's been shown to be reduced if women are informed about the possibility of that happening, which is one of the reasons I'm giving you this talk. If you go for your first screening mammogram, that's the time you're most likely to be recalled because we have no priors for comparison. So um, women need to know about the possibility they're going to be recalled. And here are the actual numbers. For every thousand women who have a screening mammogram, about 930 or 93% will get a normal result. 7% or 70 women will be recalled for additional tests. The majority of those women will only need one or additional mammographic pictures. Some will need ultrasound. And of the 70 recalled women... 11 of them will need a needle biopsy. Now those are done with local anesthetic and they should not be significantly more painful than a blood test. Of the four of the 11 women who have a needle biopsy, four of them will be diagnosed with breast cancer. In this comic, the task force member is saying, yes, regular mammograms and early detection would have saved your life, but aren't you glad we spared you all that anxiety? The task force literally thinks it's more important to save some women anxiety from being called back 
even though they know that more women, including young women, will die. This is patronizing and condescending. Women can tolerate some transient anxiety, and they should be able to decide for themselves whether they want to be screened and have the opportunity for early detection. The women I see who are the most anxious are those who find out that they have cancer and that it might have spread to the lymph nodes and that it might have been found earlier. They are anxious and justifiably angry. Someone should ask the task force, how many women is it okay to die unnecessarily to spare a handful of women some transient anxiety? You should know that the cutoff age for 50 has no scientific basis as a threshold for starting screening. Please share this information with your friends, family, and colleagues. Another risk of screening. Paula, we yes. just had a question pop up in the chat. Yeah. Um, asking exactly what does self-referral mean? Self-referral mm -hmm. means you you can phone yes. the screening program. There's a there's a 1-800 number, or if you know you which clinic you want to go to, you can phone the call it that that uh, clinic directly and book your screening appointment. The only requirement, and this kind of sucks, is that you need to be able to give the name of a family doctor, nurse practitioner, or naturopath. And, and BC is the only province that requires that. So that means a woman who doesn't have a family doctor can't have a screening mammogram in BC. Okay, that's what self-referral means. You don't need a requisition. I hope that answered the question. Okay, so carrying on. And, and um, I forgot to say at the beginning, oh, like I forgot to push the record button. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We'll try to keep most of them to the end, but Yvonne, feel free to interrupt me if anything is really pressing. So another risk of screening is called overdiagnosis. And that's a little more difficult to explain. It refers to a real cancer, which if not found by screening, would have not affected a woman's life because she would have died of something else before her cancer killed her, like heart disease or a different cancer or even a car accident. Now, overdiagnosis is more likely in older women because they have a higher likelihood of having a competing cause of death. The task force thinks that around half of all cancers are overdiagnosed, which is ridiculous, because they based their estimate on that flawed study done in Canada I told you about in the 1980s. Most experts agree that overdiagnosis occurs in one to 10% and it's negligible in younger women. Overdiagnosis is not a justification for not screening women in the 40s. Now, since we can't know when a woman's diagnosed with cancer, whether she's going to develop another disease and die of it sooner, all women with a new cancer are offered treatment. Many women are willing to accept screening risks in order to reduce the likelihood of a breast cancer death, but women should certainly be informed about false alarms and overdiagnosis. It makes no sense to deny women the opportunity to find potentially lethal cancers to avoid hypothetical overdiagnosis. So if you don't have a crystal ball and if you don't know that you'll be killed in a car accident or have a fatal heart attack in the next couple of years, mammography is a good bet. The optimal frequency of screening is annual starting at 40, but no province, no jurisdiction in Canada actually does that. More frequent screening is especially important for younger premenopausal women whose cancers grow faster. All provinces allow annual screening for women with a mother or sister with breast cancer, but I told you twice now, 85% of women who get breast cancer have no family history. Some provinces allow annual screening for women with the densest breast category, but that's only about 10% of women. So when our provincial screening programs don't offer ideal screening, it's not just because they don't want to pay for it, it's because they accept guidelines from a task force who think that women shouldn't have to suffer some transient anxiety from a screening recall, even if it increases their risk of dying of breast cancer. And many don't realize that experts strongly disagree with the task force guidelines. Now, although mammograms are important, they are not perfect. One way they're not perfect is the false alarms, detecting things that aren't cancer, like cysts, for example. Another way they're not perfect is that mammograms don't detect all cancers. Women with dense breasts and women at higher than average risk, including survivors of breast cancer and those with genetic mutations, need other screening in addition to mammography. I'm going to briefly discuss some of the tests and I'll explain them in the context of dense breasts. 
So the best way to explain density is with pictures. Dense tissue is the main reason that cancer can be missed on a mammogram. This is an obvious cancer in a 55 year old woman, so 50 year old woman actually. Um, and it's really easy to see in her because the cancer is white, all cancers are white, but the rest of her breast is dark gray and dark gray tissue on a X-ray is fat. So please just remember what this cancer looked like for the next few slides. Here's a mammogram in a woman with almost entirely fatty breasts. And if she had that cancer, we'd have no trouble seeing it. Here's a woman with a little bit more uh, white stuff in her breasts. They're not all fat. And that white stuff is normal breast tissue, which is also white. If she had that cancer, we'd have a good chance of seeing it. But these breasts are normal too, and they've got way more normal dense breast tissue, and it becomes harder to see breast cancer, which is white, in a background of normal white. We, uh, we can say it's like looking for a polar bear in a snowstorm. We might see a cancer in her if it developed up here, but if it was behind her nipple where the arrows are pointing, we might not see it. And some women have no fat and even a large cancer can be missed in this kind of breast tissue. Mammograms in fact miss up to 50% of cancers in women with the densest breasts. Now breast density is divided into four categories, A through D. Those are the pictures I just showed you. Entirely fat, scattered densities, heterogeneously dense and extremely dense. Um, category C and D are dense. Categories A and B are non-dense. The denser the breast, the more likely that a cancer can be missed. Cancer can be missed in a breast of any density depending on where the cancer is located and how much dense tissue there is. This animation shows how a small cancer easily seen in a fatty breast can be masked in a dense breast, or even in this case, it could be masked in a hardly any breast tissue category B if she's unlucky enough that her cancer superimposes what little dense tissue she has. Breast density can only be determined by a mammogram. You cannot tell by a breast exam, neither a patient or a doctor, because fatty and dense breasts can feel soft, they can feel firm, or they can feel lumpy. A radiologist looking at the mammogram makes a decision as to what category the woman is. And nowadays there's software gradually being implemented, which will be more objective in assigning a breast density category. Women who aren't having mammograms can't find out their density. Now dense breasts you need to know are normal and common. In fact, more than 40% of women over the age of 40 have dense breasts, but women need to know if they have dense breasts so they can understand the implications. In Canada, there are about 3.6 million women over age 40 with category C and D and about 600,000 of them are in the highest D category. Yet until 2018, no women in Canada were being told their breast density. Dense Breast Canada is an education and advocacy nonprofit founded by two breast cancer survivors whose cancers were delayed in diagnosis because they had dense breasts. And thanks to the tireless work of their volunteer advocates, seven Canadian provinces now directly inform women, all women of their breast density in the mammogram results letter they get in the mail after a screening mammogram. Uh, British Columbia was the first in October, 2018. Three more have committed to starting this year. So this is all a result of advo advocacy by volunteers. When a cancer is not detected on a mammogram, it continues to grow and potentially spread. Now, usually those are found as a lump after a woman's last mammogram was negative, And we call them interval cancers because they're found in the interval between planned screening mammograms. Interval cancers tend to be larger and more often spread to the lymph nodes. They tend to be more aggressive and women with interval cancers have a worse prognosis than women whose cancers are found on a screening mammogram. The biggest risk of dense breasts is the masking of cancers leading to interval cancers. But here's the double whammy. The denser the breast, the greater the risk of getting a breast cancer. And we've known since the 70s that just having dense breasts is an independent risk factor for developing cancer. Women in category D, that densest category, are five times more likely to get breast cancer than women in category A. Said another way, women in category D have double the risk of women with average density and women in category C have a 1.5 times higher risk. Having dense breasts is the most prevalent risk factor for getting breast cancer, even more than having a mother 
or sister with breast cancer. Not surprisingly, dense breasts also increases the risk of an interval cancer. Women with the densest breasts are 13 to 18 times more likely to have an interval cancer than women with fatty breasts and with worse outcomes. This study was done in the Netherlands and it confirmed that women with dense breasts are discriminated against if they only have access to mammograms for breast cancer screening, because they, those women don't benefit as much. Women with dense breasts reduced mortality by only 13%, whereas women with fatty breasts more, showed mortality reduction of 41% with mammograms. The good news is that we can find many of the cancers that are missed on mammograms when they're small with supplemental screening, and we can prevent them from becoming interval cancers. Here's how. We've known for almost 30 years that ultrasound can find many of the cancers that are missed on mammograms when they're still small and haven't spread to lymph nodes. This is a study that I published in 1995, and it was the first to prove that. I found three cancers per thousand exams, cancers that were missed on mammograms, and many subsequent studies showed the same results. British Columbia started covering screening ultrasound with provincial health insurance for women with category C and D density in 2019. Our clinic's cancer detection rate the first year was seven per thousand. Remember I said that in 2019, we, we found three per thousand. We're now finding seven per thousand. And in 2019, our audit showed that they were all small and none had spread to the lymph nodes. Some health authorities would like to save money and restrict access to supplemental screening for women with category D only, not C, and or women with a family history. But I want you to see that 40% of the cancers we found were in women with no family history and 60% were in category C. So ideally all women who have category C and D breast density should have access to supplemental screening. Women with dense breasts sometimes ask if they could skip the mammogram and just have the ultrasound. The short answer is no. Mammograms can see some cancers that are missed on ultrasound. And ultrasound usually can't see calcifications, which can sometimes be the first sign of an early breast cancer. Another test that can find cancers missed on mammograms is called digital breast tomosynthesis, also called TOMO for short. Sometimes it's called 3D mammography. It's not a separate test. It's just a better mammogram. It addresses the two weaknesses of regular 2D mammograms. It finds more cancers and it reduces recalls, those false alarms, from screening. It's rapidly replacing 2D mammography in the US, but it's not used routinely in Canada, except for some clinics in Alberta. And there is a, a multinational trial uh, that we are participating in, in British Columbia, uh, that's looking at the benefits of uh, tomosynthesis. MRI has been used for women at very high risk since 2007. It has the highest cancer detection rate uh, of those missed on mammograms between 10 and 16 in the first round. It uses no ionizing radiation. It's been proven to reduce interval cancers and late stage disease. The downsides are that it requires an IV and standard MRI requires about 45 minutes in the magnet. So claustrophobia makes it less well tolerated for some women. In fact, in two large studies of MRI, only about 40% of the women agreed to have it, even though it was free. In general, MRI can't be done in patients with pacemakers and some other implants. It's very expensive and access is inadequate in most of Canada. This chart comparing mammography, ultrasound and MRI shows that the highest detection rate is with MRI and mammography. And if you're doing that, there's no point in adding ultrasound because you won't find any additional cancers. Now there's a faster way of doing breast MRI called abbreviated MRI or sometimes fast MRI. Instead of that conventional scan taking 45 minutes, this realm requires about 10 minutes in the scanner and it's faster to read. Those two things should make it less expensive and it should make it more tolerable for women with claustrophobia, but it still requires an intravenous. MRI is more easily available and widely used in the US. There it's recommended for women with the BRCA mutation women who've had chest radiation for lymphoma before age 30, both of which are also done in Canada, but in the States, they also recommended for women who've had breast cancer, who have dense breasts, and for women of all breast densities who develop cancer before age 50. In Europe, MRI is now recommended for all women in category D every two to three years, but no less often than every four years. 
If MRI is not available or for women who can't tolerate it, they recommend mammography and ultrasound. Another test is called contrast enhanced mammography and it's very promising and emerging test, especially for women who qualify for uh, or should qualify for MRI, but can't have it. It uses regular mammography equipment and intravenous contrast and has a similar cancer detection rate, which is almost as good as MRI. It's not yet in wide use, but over 30 hospitals across Canada have purchased the necessary equipment. There are a couple of blood tests now available, sometimes called liquid biopsies, and some companies are aggressively marketing them to the public to screen for breast and other cancers. The research studies are small and they're so far incomplete, so you got to be skeptical. This may eventually prove to be a game changer, but it's too early to judge. And of course, AI. AI is, AI is going to be a playing a significant role in everything we do, including screening and diagnosing breast cancer. The science is evolving rapidly with studies published almost weekly. My guess is that it will be used to pre-read screening mammograms and will be able to filter out at least 20% as assuredly negative so they don't even need to be looked at by a radiologist. And it will be used to analyze the mammogram for density and other characteristics in addition to clinical risk factors to determine an individual woman's risk of breast cancer so we can move to more personalized screening rather than a one size fits all approach. I'm running out of time, but I can't resist sharing this Canadian research with you. This is relatively new in the last year. Yeah. Colleagues in Ottawa have produced critical research showing what was already known from modeling, but not shown uh, until now with real patient data. They've been able to mine the data that's results from that natural experiment we have in Canada with provinces following different screening regimens. In peer-reviewed publications, they've shown that provinces that offer annual mammograms for women with dense breasts have lower interval cancer rates than provinces that screen only every two years. That's not been adopted yet. They've shown that in provinces that start screening at 40, women are diagnosed at a lower stage of breast cancer, not only in the 40s, but in the 50s. And not only that, that women have better 10-year net survival. And yet, they're, like, so far, we don't see any of that being adopted in Canada. They've also shown that the increases in the actual costs of treating cancer have risen exponentially since they were published about 10 years ago, especially for higher stage disease because of all the new wonderful drugs. It now costs up to half a million dollars to treat one single case of stage four cancer, depending on the molecular subtype. It costs 11 times as much for stage four compared to stage one. If we screened women starting at 40 and found their cancers at a lower stage, it might just be cost effective. So summing up, what does optimal screening look like and how can you get it? Annual mammograms for all average risk women starting at 40. Well, in, in British Columbia, at least you know you can go without a doctor's referral and please start at 40. Not enough women are taking advantage of that. Most provinces screen only every two years. Um, and so it becomes even more important for women to do breast self-exam and for women with dense breasts to have supplemental screening because mammography every two years just isn't gonna find cancers as early as possible. Women should keep screening um, as long as they're in good health with the life expectancy of seven to 10 years. So if you're in a province that, that doesn't allow women to self-refer after 74, get a requisition, hopefully you can have a get a requisition from a family doctor. All women should know their breast density and women with dense breasts should have access to supplemental screening, usually with ultrasound, the high risk women, very high risk with MRI or contrast mammography if it's available. So ask for a requisition. Let go of these myths that breast cancer only occurs in middle-aged and older women, that you won't get breast cancer if you don't have a family history, that all breast cancers can be detected on a mammogram, that breast cancer always appears as a lump that compression of the breast and radiation from a mammogram can cause breast cancer and that you can't get screened if you have breast implants. These are all false. Now, everything I discussed today can be found in this free guide on the Dense Breast Canada website. And you'll also find this free toolkit on how to advocate for yourself if you need it. And this uh, is mybreastscreening.ca. There are scripts you can use uh, to advocate yourself for yourself with your GP or nurse practitioner. And you'll get all this in the recording. These are all the uh, references I cited on my slides. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Take it away, Yvonne.
Okay, great. Thanks so much, Paula. Just wanted to thank you for that presentation. And I couldn't help but notice during it that the policies in BC are better than other parts of Canada. And I bet you had something to do with that. So thank you for that. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, so I've got a couple questions here. Um, the first one is, what do you do if you don't have a family doctor or nurse practitioner? Can you get a referral from a walk-in? Yes. Do everything you can to get, you don't even need the referral. You just need to give their name that they will, you know, accept your report and the, the their justification. I've been trying, you know, other, we're the only province that does that. And when I say to them, come on, the, the, why don't you figure out a way around this? Like every other province has. And when the, when the um, program was instituted, what they were worried about is that a woman with an abnormality might fall through the cracks and not get investigated. So now instead they're letting women fall through the cracks by not even doing the mammogram, but that's another story. So yes, um, beg, borrow, steal, ask your friends to ask their family doctors if, if they'll accept you just so you can have your screening mammogram. And would your results be mailed to you then if you don't have a physician to follow? Yes, every woman who goes to the screening program gets a copy of her result in lay language. The family doctor gets a report and the patient gets a report. And starting in 2018, that's when they added to the mammogram report, like congratulations, your mammogram's negative. They'll say, you have breast density, A, B, C, or D. Now, BC is guilty of this, but so are other provinces. They'll tell you your breast density, but then they play down the significance of having dense breasts. And um, I've, I've seen some of the other provinces, they even make it sound like only category D really matters. But you just saw, I mean, 60% of the cancers that we found with screening ultrasound are in women with category C. So those women deserve to get supplemental screening as well. Great. Uh, I have another question here. Women in mid fifties in C density, how often um, should I have mammogram plus ultrasound yearly? Um, Good question. Ultrasound be self-referred. Okay. So um, with the mammograms, if you don't have a mother, sister, or daughter with breast cancer, you're only going to be allowed to go every two years for the mammogram. For screening breast ultrasound, you need a doctor's requisition. You need to be category C or D, and the doctor has to be willing to give you a requisition. And if for any strange re, I mean, you can tell them it's covered by MSP, and they should be able to confirm that. But but look on that toolkit on uh, mybreastscreening.ca. It'll tell you how to talk to your GP. And of course, nobody wants to piss off their family doctor now and get fired because there are no family doctors to you know to be had. But um, what we recommend is don't have your mammogram and ultrasound at the same time because you're if you're having your mammogram every two years. If you had your mammogram and ultrasound together, then you'd be two years with nothing. What we recommend is that you have the mammogram halfway, sorry, the ultrasound halfway between screening mammograms. So if you're having a mammogram every two years at time, the time one, have your mammogram. A year later, have an ultrasound. A year later, have a mammogram and so on. And that way you're getting checked in some way every year. And breast self-exam, they used to make women feel guilty if they didn't do it every month. You know, it does, you don't have to be that obsessive, but that's also the way that some cancers are found earlier is women um, will, will do a breast exam and say, whoa, that wasn't there before. You know, the way that women detect interval cancers, I call it um, unintentional breast self-exam. A woman will be in the shower and it's, whoa, what's that golf ball out there? Um, but she wasn't planning to examine her breasts. But, you know, if you just do that, even in the shower, it's sometimes easier when your hands are slippery with soap to slide over the skin. Women with a larger pendulous breast have to lift their hand up to elevate the breast so they can examine the inferior hemisphere and get right down to that inframammary crease. So um, that's the schedule, depends on how often you're having the mammogram. Okay. Great. I have another question here, um, which I think it just sounds like perhaps the person's experience is a bit different than what you reported here, but how do you get the breast density results after a mammogram? I have asked and was told it, it was not available in a special test is required. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, for a while, some of the radiologists were rebelling and weren't, weren't, weren't even marking it on the report form, but they have to now. And that only started in October, 2018. If you've had a mammogram 
through the BC screening program uh, since uh, October, 2018, it's on the report you get in the mail. Now, if you're for some reason not going to the screening program and you're having a diagnostic mammogram, it should be in that report, but it's less reliable. And then you do have to ask your doctor. But the screening program, everybody finds out. Um, I just saw this uh, comment come in. and I want to tell you that it doesn't apply anymore. I was told at the screening clinic that you could book the mammogram anytime after 18 months. Well, they found out that we were telling people that. And so now they're making people wait like 23 months uh, or two years. It's um, It used to be the case that you could book after 18 months. Mm. I'll go to the question here. Other than lumps, what physical signs should we look for? And is tiggling sensation a factor? Almost never. That um, itchiness and tingling are kind of in the spectrum. They're the, the earliest that if they get worse, it turns into pain. And um, pain is normal and common and almost never a sign of breast cancer. But if you've never had pain before and you start to get it, I mean, it, it's quite common actually that um, pain and, and discomfort kick in in a woman's, let's say, early 30s and then stick around until after menopause. Some women don't have pain until they're in the menopause transition time. But pain is not a bad sign. It's just, <clears throat> it's not a reliable sign one way or the other. And if you're due for your mammogram, have a mammogram. Uh, there's a question here about um, uh, somebody has a breast density D and the mother died of breast cancer. Um, just having a mother with breast cancer and do that risk calculator, that IBIS risk calculator. Um, but most women whose mothers have had breast cancer are not at high risk. They're at higher than average risk, but they don't fall into the category where they would have an MRI. So definitely start with ultrasound. Great. Maybe we'll just field that last question here and then we can finish up on time, which is great. Um, so what is the difference between a regular mammogram and a diagnostic mammogram? Okay, a, a screening mammogram is one do, done through the BC Cancer Breast Screening Program. It's for women who aren't having any problems with their breasts. They're just going to get screened to find what, you know, what they don't expect. If a woman has a breast complaint, um, a symptom like a lump or discharge or sometimes pain, then she's referred for a diagnostic mammogram and you need a requisition for that. For screening, if you're having no problems, you don't need a requisition, you go to the screening program. The two examinations start out the same. A diagnostic mammogram starts with four pictures, two of each breast, like I showed you. But the difference is that on a screening mammogram, the pictures are taken and they send you away. They're usually read within the next couple of days. And if there's anything that needs any more attention, then you are recalled. Theoretically with a diagnostic mammogram, if there's something that needs more pictures or any additional investigation, they try to do it on the day you're there for that mammogram. So you don't need to be recalled, but depending on how busy the clinic is and whether there's a radiologist um, working there that day, um, sometimes that doesn't happen, which isn't ideal, but just that's life. Oh, we have, I just have one more question sure. in here from, do you want to pop, do you want to speak up? We'll see if you can catch the audio. I'm not sure if you ad addressed this, you were talking about pain and I caught the sort of pain being common through your reproductive years. Is pain more significant finding postmenopausal then or? Not really. Nope. There's some women continue having pain even after menopause and we don't know why. Um, and, and certainly it would be considerably less worrisome if it was just always there and yeah, you still have it. But um, it's it's almost more of a good excuse to, to have a mammogram. Um, but uh, Pain as a, as a solitary uh, symptom with no palpable lump almost never turns out to be breast cancer. It needs to be investigated, not ignored, no pat on the head. Um, uh, but certainly in younger women, we dismiss it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, let's... Let's call it there. Thank you so much, uh, Paula, for speaking to us here at the clinic and to everyone. And we have the thank yous coming in here on the chat too um, and sharing all that very helpful information and um, making us all think about being health advocates for ourselves um, with breast cancer. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you.
Okay, and you, you're going to stop recording and send me the, the, or I don't know if I get the link. You may have to send it to me. I'll stop recording now.